the last 20 years, I've been working in a number of areas where there have been conflicts and where there are conflicts, there tend to be humanitarian crises and uh, ultimately long-term setbacks in terms of development. And, uh, we might describe these today as fragile states or fragile settings. Um, there are a whole range of nomenclature out there to describe these settings. And what struck me 20 years ago and, and, and certainly over the last decades has been that the response of the aid community, and, and by aid community I, I mean both the relief sector, the humanitarian sector, but also the development community, has tended to be almost working on the symptoms rather than the deeper underlying causes. Uh, they tend to go in, and, and I think the, in the jargon, they tend to apply band-aid solutions. There's a, a knee-jerk response to be the first on the ground. Uh, there's the usual complications around coordination and collective action. Uh, and there tended to be uh, an almost quick-in, quick-out mentality. And 20 years ago, there was an expression about the relief and development gap. And I think that expression persists, which suggests to me that we still haven't managed to bridge the gap particularly effectively. But the focus was, how do we transfer from that quick in, quick out relief into a longer term development? But it still, over the last 20 years, has been highly mechanistic. It's been highly technical. Uh, it tended to emphasize the skills and capabilities of outsiders and not those on the ground. Uh, and there tended to always be the dismay and sadness at the end that these well-intentioned efforts didn't generate the dividends that were expected of them. And so billions and billions of dollars of ODA, Overseas Development Assistance, dollars later, I think many aid agencies and actors and experts are still scratching their heads and puzzled over why is it that these outside efforts have yet to be able to bridge uh, the relief development gap, let alone provide some kind of durable solution to those who are affected by violence and natural disaster. About 10 years ago, a number of colleagues and I got together, some colleagues from the MIT, from Harvard, from the Graduate Institute in Switzerland uh, and elsewhere, as well as aid workers, and started to think about what was it that made some of these efforts, most of these efforts fail, but made others succeed? And how was it that there were many communities that were beset by natural disasters and wars that managed to survive, not only survive, thrive in the case of extreme uncertainty and fragility and disruption. And this led us to think about a concept, a concept that actually comes from ecosystems theory of resilience. Resilience, I think today it seems to be common parlance, but 10 years ago was really nestled within a very small subsection of the natural sciences. Um, resilience implies an ability or capability to adapt, to cope, to respond, to rebound even in the instance of facing acute stress. It implies a wide range of coping strategies amongst institutions and individuals and, and others uh, in the face of uncertainty and predictability uh, and in many cases extreme forms of violence uh, and natural disaster. And so we started a project, the Urban Resilience Project, uh, based in Geneva and Boston, uh, but working in eight different cities around the world, in Africa and Asia and Latin America, but also in North America and elsewhere focusing in on different cities, their institutions and individuals, and trying to understand, using a range of different methodologies, what was it about these particular actors that allowed them to fail, that allowed them to succeed, that allowed them to manage and cope with these kinds of stress. And what we found were some really fascinating findings. We, we actually found that there were not just positive forms of resilience, in other words, instances where uh, communities banded together with positive collective action, uh, managed to develop and retrofit new forms of services in the absence of the state, and were able to, to really come back stronger in some instances. There are also instances of negative resilience, where in fact we saw perverse forms of collective action. We, fought, we saw criminal groups coming together and filling in the vacuums where the state had maybe withered away. And this led us as academics at the time to think, that we couldn't necessarily apply a positivist or assume a positive uh, attribute to resilience. Resilience, in a way, was benign. It could go in either direction. But that was the empirical part. What was more interesting and probably more important for us was thinking about the policy implications of this. In other words, were, were there possible ways that outsiders and insiders could help foster and strengthen resilience in communities? Were there ways through an integrated and holistic and comprehensive approach drawing on a range of disciplines that aid agencies in particular, 
groups like World Vision, MSF, CARE, the ICRC even, uh, Oxfam, SAVE, the UN, were there ways that these agencies could start to cultivate and nurture resilience in communities uh, in a very practical and concrete way so that they might be able to weather the coming storm? So they might be able to prepare themselves in the event of ethnic tension or religious tension or political violence. Um, and so from that project 10 years ago, we started to extract lessons and we started to share those lessons with different agencies. Uh, and we started to work with the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, especially the Development Assistance Committee, the OECD DAC. The OECD DAC is that particular organ that for 30 plus countries helps standardize and mandate the rules for which aid from governments and others can be ascribed to development. And we figured if we could get the OECD DAC and other bilateral agencies to start thinking about resilience in a critical way, maybe we could also influence the direction of their aid. And of course, the direction of their aid towards non-governmental organizations, towards international agencies and also grassroots groups. And so looking back 10 years later, I think I can, we can all say this group, uh, we can say with some, I guess, some satisfaction that we've seen a spread in a way of, of some of these concepts. We've seen it expanded in all sorts of exciting and new and interesting ways. We've seen people not just focus on ecosystems theory, but bring in sociology and anthropology and economics and all sorts of other different creative ways of, of understanding how basically communities and households and individuals uh, react and adapt and cope and respond to duress. Um, and I think that I hope with time that these kinds of concepts will contribute to improving and enhancing the quality of aid the durability of assistance, and that we get away from that quick in, quick out, band-aid style solution, which I think most aid workers desperately want to avoid, and I think are conscious that they don't want to repeat. Mm -hmm.